Welcome everybody to the SIAC KCAB International Soul Webinar. Our webinar today is entitled BTS, Squid Game and Mobile Games, Arbitration and the Korean Wave. My name is Michelle Sonnen. I am the head of Northeast Asia at SIAC and I am joined by my Squid Game Game Masters today. And we have a very exciting program um, lined up. But before we begin, I just want to thank you all for joining us from around the world. Um, we are really delighted to be here participating in the Seoul ADR Festival. Um, this is an annual event put on by our friends at KCAB International. We are also very fortunate and happy to be co-hosting this webinar with KCAB International. Um, we have collaborated on many events over the years and we're delighted to, to do so again for this year's Seoul, Inter um, Seoul ADR Festival. So today's webinar um, is an exciting one, in case you can't already tell from my, <laughs> from my game masters. Um, I'm sure by now all of you have heard of Squid Game, even if you haven't seen it. Um, it's the K-drama that's taken the world by storm. Korean pop culture has really seen an incredible rise in recent months and years, um, with Korean music, dramas, and movies topping the charts worldwide. Um, in my own experience, it's difficult to get through a single day without seeing at least one Squid Game meme or um, some kind of Squid Game reference on social media or in the news. Just a few weeks ago, the term Korean wave was added to the Oxford English Dictionary, along with a handful of other words originating out of K-culture. In this webinar, we are going to be taking a look at K the K-wave, but through a, a slightly, slightly different lens we're going to be exploring whether the global rise of K-culture will lead to more cross-border disputes and whether arbitration is best suited to resolve those disputes. To answer that question, I am thrilled to welcome our panel of experts based in Korea, China, Singapore, and the US. Joining us today, um, first we have Ms. Yuna Kong, Chief Representative of the Beijing office, Reveal yourself, Yuna. <laughs> and, uh, Chief Representative of the Beijing office of a leading Korean law firm, Lee & Co. Yuna has represented Korean companies or Korea invested companies in arbitrations in mainland China, and she regularly advises various companies in relation to business between Korea and China. She has also represented Chinese game companies in arbitrations against leading Korean game companies conducted in accordance with various institutional rules. We are also fortunate to have Mr. Nicholas Lau, partner at Raja Anton in Singapore, where his practice areas are entertainment and media, intellectual property, and technology. While intellectual property and software implementation disputes remain his love from a star, in recent months, Nicholas has also had several briefs for IP advisory work for acquisitions, drafting of software licenses, license agreements, and regulatory work in relation to telemedicine crash land onto him. Next, we have Ms. Sungmin Lee, partner, oh, reveal yourself, Nick. <laughs> Next, we have Ms. Sung Min Lee, partner at Peter and Kim in Singapore. Um, and she is, uh, we're delighted to also have Sung Min today. She's dual qualified as a lawyer in Korea and as a solicitor in England and Wales. She has represented major Korean IP clients in arbitrations under a wide range of institutional rules and has acted extensively in multi billion dollar cross border enforcement actions. Last but certainly not least, we have Mr. Dan Tan principal of Dan Tan Law, a boutique arbitration law firm based in New York, San Francisco, and Singapore, which has been ranked in GAR 100 for the past decade. Dan acts as counsel and arbitrator, particularly in cases involving US and Asia, and is on the faculty of Harvard Law School, Stanford Law School, um, Stanford Law School and Stanford Law School, where he teaches international investment law and international arbitration. Dan, reveal yourself. <laughs> Uh, moderating this session is Mr. Jungi Kim, Professor of Law at Yonsei Law School in Seoul, Korea. Professor Kim has extensive experience acting as presiding arbitrator, sole arbitrator, and co-arbitrator in institutional and ad hoc proceedings under various institutional rules. He is a member of the ICC court. And he also serves on the panel of arbitrators for a number of institutions, including SIAC and KCAB. All right, Mr. Frontman, now it's your turn to reveal yourself. Ah. Okay. 
Thank you all for to our panelists for sharing your time and expertise with us today. I'm now going to hand it over to Professor Kim to get the panel started. Have a great session. Thank you so much, Michelle. Of course, uh, uh, we would like to make this a very interactive and fun and dynamic session. So if anybody has questions, feel free to uh, post them and we'll try to incorporate them as best we can. Um, as we all know, whether it's BTS, whether it's Blackpink, whether it's Minari, whether it's Parasite, um, K-Wave, K-Culture um, has continued to uh, occupy enormous space in our world. And um, as a result, the industry and the market has grown leaps and bounds beyond anyone's imagination. Um, and of course, in our world, um, explosive growth and big growth, inevitably, the nature of the beast leads sometimes to disputes. And of course, we've actually had some huge, very large, multiple cases, nine figure cases uh, involving Korean parties and that had a cultural component to them. Um, so we'd like to take a look at all these things and see where we're going, where we're at, and what lies in the future. Um, so there's nobody better uh, to answer the first question, of course, is, is this Korean wave phenomenon, is it, why, why has it suddenly appeared and why is Korea on the map or is this a sudden recent thing, Dan? Well, well, first of all, thanks, Michelle, for inviting me to speak at this seminar. And thank you, Professor Kim, for, um, you know, introducing the, the, the topic and, of course, um, you know, organizing everything today. So um, although I probably, I, I think most of my Korean friends actually tell me I eat more Korean food than, than they do, but I'm actually not Korean. So my perspective is from, you know, somebody who grew up in Asia uh, and who now practices in Asia and, and sort of like lives and practices in the U.S. So. Um, I would say, and, and this question gives me a chance to be one of the cool kids, because what I would say is that the Korean wave is not new. Um, you know, I think the Korean entertainment industry, particularly the movie industry, I think has been the movie making capital, at least of Asia, I, I think for almost 20 years now. Uh, when I grew up, you know, I watched um, movies primarily made in Hong Kong, um, you know, movies from Hong Kong, I think they're, they're actually much fewer now. And almost every movie is, is sort of like, you know, big blockbuster hit from Asia is made in, in Korea now. And you can think of all the movies we've talked about, um, you know, even those we have in like Train to Busan, my favorite zombie movie. Uh, but of course my favorite movie of all time, and this is gonna reveal my age, but it's, it's this movie. Ah. And I think those people <laughs> who, are, who are older will recognize it. But if you haven't watched it, you absolutely need to. I would also spare you the grief of watching the sequel. Um, don't, don't bother, just, just watch the original. But this movie, I just checked today to remind myself when I first saw it, and this is actually 20 years ago uh, but that this movie was released. So uh, back then, the I don't really realize- the critical scene in that movie comes from Yonsei University. Yeah, that is true, that is true. <laughs> so this is a great movie, you know, don't bother about the sequel. But, you know, back then I had to really realize there was already a spate of Korean movies. So, uh, you know, I think to say something is, you know, the Korean wave is something more recent. Uh, probably that's not true for, I think, most of us who, who grew up in Asia and who've seen all these movies in the past. Um, and perhaps the one big thing um, I, I think Professor Kim knows, I'm a big foodie. So, uh, you know, talking about culture, you know, we've talked a bit about Korean movies, Korean music. I'm a bit too old to listen to BTS, but, uh, you know, an integral part of culture to me is always the food. And Korean food has always, you know, been available everywhere. Um, I was recently in Madrid and guess where I was at? At a Korean restaurant. Uh, which <laughs> And as you all know, in New York, one of the Michelin star um, steakhouses is actually a Korean steakhouse. So, you know, I, I'd say it, Korean culture has permeated, you know, the world long before this uh, mm. Korean wave. Uh, so Nicholas, um, I'm, so since you're um, expert in all kinds of areas involving, what, what kind of disputes do you see coming or rising out of the Korean wave? So obviously, you know, I, I will answer this as an IP lawyer. Okay. Um, you know, obviously, 
as as things become more well known worldwide, you know, uh, you know, you have you have these big names and big trademarks, and you know, obviously all sorts of IP being exposed to other countries. There is, of course, you know, the, in its most traditional form, the traditional form of IP infringement. So as you see now, you know, a lot of the masks, a lot of the the memorabilia from Squid uh, Squid Games that you can buy are probably, you know, obviously not officially produced. You buy them off Alibaba or whatever it is. Um, and and but you know, so in its most basic form, that's what you would get. But you know, it can even go to something a lot more nefarious. I don't know if you're aware there was a cryptocurrency based on Squid Games. Um, so they created a squid token and people were buying into it uh, on the basis that it, you know, it, was, it was supposed to be a play to win kind of thing. So you would play a game to get more tokens, which you could you know, exchange for cash. And it went from one cent to like $2,800 last night before absolutely collapsing because it was in, in essence a scam because people would buy in and wouldn't be able to, buy, to, to sell their tokens. So last night, the entire thing collapsed and you know, obviously... A lot of people would buy it not realizing that this entire endeavor is not tied to Squid Games in any kind of way, except they use SQID as, as its token identifier. Um, you know, so you can have that kind of thing happening. And from there, you can have disputes in relation to, you know, perhaps people, you know, get into agreements with each other to, to invest in, in something like that, um, you know. Um, but obviously, from a contractual perspective, there are more. There are things like distribution agreements, licensing agreements that you know um, companies in Korea would have with countries overseas for merchandising, you know, distribution, distribution of IP rights. And then, if you talk about things like video games, you can have um, all sorts of different disputes. Um, I mean, the, the most interesting ones we've done relate to the presence of um, you know like pirate servers so normally the way games are now you know you don't play it on your own computer in a sense it's not running off your hard drive you know you're connecting to a server somewhere else in order to play it and people will connect to a pirate server which is not officially um, you know sanctioned by the game developer in order to play the game so a copy of the game is actually being run on that server and they've they've made tweaks on on the game itself to to allow players to get certain benefits and so we've been asked questions before about you know the legality of this and what what uh, developers can do about it, um, and you know we've had situations also where video game you know a lot of these games are, are quite similar in, in the way they play and the, 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 you know they use similar characters and things like that. So we've also had queries relating to you know how how a developer can protect their IP in terms of the character design, the way that the game plays, and, you know. I mean, that's a, a, it's a tough one, especially when the name of the games are, are, are very different and everyone kind of knows they're playing a different game. But so to a certain degree, obviously, the developers feel very aggrieved when someone creates what is essentially a copy of the game that they've created and they're making a lot of money from. So, you know, there, there's so many possibilities that can arise. Obviously, you know, if you just leave aside the, the realm of traditional basic IP infringement, you know, once once things get famous like this, I mean, the sky's the limit as to what can possibly take place and what can be, you know, what can be disputed. So, so of course, based on what you're telling me, Nicholas, you of all people are forced to play games as part of your profession. <laughs> <laughs> Well, you know, you know, we, we've all got to take, uh, you know, we've got to take a hit somewhere, you know, someone's got to take the, take the time and out. You, to, and your you time charge? Well, <laughs> only joking, joking. only so much is required to, to, you know, get an understanding of the way the game plays. And some mm. of these games are very long. You know? mm -hmm. So, so um, uh, of course, uh, we're aware that a lot of these disputes um, have arisen between Korean and Chinese parties. And we've heard, of course, that um, Yuna, unfortunately, has been in China for the past two years, uh, unable to leave. And what, what has your experience like between been between uh, disputes between uh, Korean parties and Chinese parties right, that are related to um, the Korean wave or Korean culture? Thank you, Professor Kim. Um... Uh, Lianco has also represented the Chinese game company and its affiliated companies in arbitration cases regarding some of those license agreements uh, such as, uh, that Mr. Lau just told. Um, and uh, in China, there, because of uh, 
a very specific and unique uh, policy uh, exists in China, especially with the effect of anti da Chinese policy. Some of those agreements could not be performed in the mainland China around and after 2016. And some of those could not be performed due to the disputes between the co-owners of the Korean licensors. So in our experience, license agreement related arbitrations, including issues related to the different co-ownership institutions under Korean law, Chinese law, and sometimes under the governing laws of the relevant license agreements. Also related to um, fact related evidences uh, regarding how to distinguish games under the license agreements in disputes when they are when there are many versions of such games in the course of developing and launching games and how to prove the revenue and royalty of those games uh, if it is across the cross board transaction so these are the issues that comes out from license agreement disputes and as to the types of the arbitration cases in China related to the Korean race, um, of course, uh, most of them are license agreements related disputes, uh, but there are some distribution agreement related disputes claiming payment or damages under the agreement because with the influence of the Korean wave, a lot of Chinese game companies, including Tencent, have executed a lot of license agreements with Korean game companies to publish Korean game in the mainland China since 2000s. And Chinese OTT over the top companies such as Tencent Video, IGE, Yoku have also executed license agreements to introduce Korean dramas and films in Taiwan and China. So once such dramas and games become popular, many Chinese production companies try to get exclusive license agreements for producing related products. And then Chinese distributors or retailers such as Jingdong or Taobao uh, or other companies operating flagship stores on those platforms have executed distribution agreements for selling those products in the mainland China. So following these commercial chains, a number of license agreements and distribution agreements have been executed and disputes related to those agreements recourse to arbitration. And apart from those types of cases, we can also think about arbitration arising out of negative side of the Korean way. There have been several incidents of moral lapse and violations of laws involving Korean celebrities such as tax fraud, sexual assault, and drug abuse. Thus, I was once asked to provide legal analysis related to the termination of the production agreement between Korean entertainment company and Chinese filming making company. Since Chinese filming making company cannot broadcast films or dramas where such Korean celebrities appear in those films or dramas. So considering the huge amounts of damages might be incurred due to the suspension of broadcasting films or dramas after completing making them, there are tentative huge arbitration cases under such negative side of the Korean way. Mm. And, and uh, one more thing I'd like to point out that um, especially between Chinese company and Korean company, Arbitration uh, is the best feasible way of resolving disputes arising out of those agreements because there are no definitive recent Korean Supreme Court cases which support the recognition and execution of Chinese court decision and vice versa. So even though there was a Korean court case back in 1999 which recognized Chinese court decision on the premises of the existence of reciprocity between Korea and China. But afterwards, there have been two Chinese court cases which refused to recognize Korean court's decision. So it became uncertain whether the Korean court would recognize the Chinese court's decision 
even though two more recent Chinese court cases came out, which recognized Korean court decision in 2019 and 2020. Mm. But those are only local precedents and cannot represent the whole courts of the mainland China. So that's why I think that there are a lot of tentative arbitration cases mm. related to the Korean wave in China. Wow. So that means that overall, there really have not been similar enforcement problems in arbitration awards. Oh, yes. Uh, like uh, for enforcement. Right, right, the right. Foreign, foreign award in China. Mm -hmm. um, from an institutional perspective, China became a signatory of the New York Convention mm. in April 1987. Mm. So, and the Arbitration Act of China came into effect in 1995. Uh, so except for the typical situations such as there is no arbitration agreement, non-arbitral matter, or lack of fairness in procedures, or execution is against social and public interest, etc. All foreign arbitral award may be enforced in mm -hmm. China. Mm -hmm. And maybe the question may arise as to how many percentage of the mm -hmm. foreign arbitral award is enforced actually in practice. Right. And amazingly, so yeah. So and I imagine, of course, uh, for SEAC awards and KCAB awards, it's 100% enforcement, I'm sure. Yes, amazingly. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, okay, um, why don't we move on? I know, of course, um, you know, since uh, Yuna is based in China right now, um, Man Sungmin, of course, is where uh, Nicholas is. She's actually in Singapore and she's represented many Korean companies uh, I think kind of on the other side of the table also frequently where uh, the counterparty or Chinese parties. And let's, it'd be interesting to hear what Sungmin's perspective is like and where she, what kind of trends she thinks uh, will, be, will occur in the future. Thank you so much, Professor Kim. So I have been representing many gaming companies against Chinese parties. And I think it would be a good start to share my experience and see, uh, share the current trends in the gaming industry particularly to the gaming industry in China. So the scope of intellectual rights in the, in the content business normally extends to the copyright and the trademark as the two pillars, and also includes like characters, visual display, background story, script, as well as name of the places, objects, the rules, the play patterns, the interactions among characters, layout, look and feel, and any other element that user can recognize as a characteristic element of the relevant game. So normally an IP right holders enter into a license agreement and the execution of an IP license agreement in this industry will mean that to grant a right to create and distribute derivative works and use a trademark based on the characteristics element of the original work, obviously subject to the terms of the agreement. And in the Chinese industry, there has been a high increasing demands for IPs so all of the Chinese gaming companies, they were, they were rushing to, they were competing against each other to get uh, popular Korean IPs and get become the licensees of the Korean IPs, not only limited to Korean IPs, but also Japanese IPs, the, the, all the popular IPs. And this has been a strong trend that we have been seeing these days. So I just want to share why we are seeing these trends in this gaming industry in China. So first of all, it is because the period of development has been shortened. It usually takes a long time of time and money for a game product to be produced and ultimately serviced. The important elements applicable to the development of game projects can be broken down to, into three, three stages. So first you game design, programming, and graphics. Of these three elements, the stage of planning takes most of the time, while the graphic uses most of the financial resources. Planning is about how to make what, while graphic is about how to express what is planned. Planning requires many hours of hard thinking and graphic requires many artists. So it means a lot of money. But with a, a, uh, if, you have a, if you develop a, a derivatives based on a famous IPs, it means that you don't have to waste all these times, for time for planning and expenses for graphic. You can skip this procedure. So it's a strong benefit. The second reason why we're seeing this trend is because the method of production reduces marketing or advertisement costs. 
So in the PC era, online gaming, it was slightly different. Producing mobile, producing games in mobile games and web games today costs less and the distribution channel for service becomes very much simplified. You can imagine Apple app stores, Google Play stores, or dedicated web game platforms. It's much more simplified. So this means like there's a growing numbers of new games pouring into the market. So it becomes like a, a saturated market. A games, but then at the same time, a gamer's leisure time for playing games cannot be simply extended, even though there are so many, so many famous good games out there. It doesn't mean that a, a gamer uh, a gamer can suddenly play 10 hours a day when he was normally playing three hours a day. So in the present market where most of the games gamers already already have their favorite two or three favorite games in particular then the only way to jump in, into this competitive market and is to steal these users who are already loyal to other existing games. And in this case, the IP of a famous game itself becomes a powerful weapon for competition because they recognize these things and it becomes very, because, based, because they are familiar with these games. So it becomes a very powerful tool. For example, if there are so many new, new games out there, but then all of a sudden there's like a squid game game, a new game, then would you be interested to click on that game and start it? So the, the, uh, the sense of, or if there's a game and then there are uh, Darth Vader and uh, Han Solo, and like there are some, some Prince characters with- I mean, you're revealing your side. age. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sorry. <laughs> then, then won't you be interested to actually click on the game? So in the Chinese gaming industry, they say that the existence of a well-known IP usually determines the difference of initial market expenses by 20 times, although we have to verify it. So that's the second. The last reason is like the large scale publisher developers leading the game market shifted their weight of their strategy from releasing multi products in a genre portfolio to selecting and focusing on small number of products. So those are the reasons why now in the Chinese market, they're rushing to get really famous IPs of the Korean market or the Japanese market. Um, so in the Chinese market, that's a trend. All of the famous IP owners, they, they are being given license to the Chinese parties. But at the same time, the, Chinese, the, the trend also is that these Chinese licensees, they're very, very clever and they know the local market. So they come up with these derivatives that can actually be argued as not really based on the original IP. So a lot of dispute arises out of whether it's based on the original IP or not. And that, uh, that becomes a very sensitive uh, question to the arbitration practitioner, because normally in a license agreement, they have a dispute resolution clause. Normally they would put in like arbitration. But then if they are, they're creating a derivative out of the scope of the license agreement, would it be a, a, a question scope of for the copyright infringement or would it be within the arbitration like uh, arbitration agreement? And that's, that's always a gray area that's always been disputed in both in the arbitration setting and in the cop, uh, copyright infringement litigation. And then there were always the, these arguments coming out like list pendants or like estoppel, whether that's within the arbitration agreement, these like jurisdictional challenge was always, was always be the, an issue. Hmm. Hmm. Um, and um, in your experience, um, kind of uh, what do the arbitration agreements look like in most a lot of these disputes? Are, are, um, I presume that a lot of them are between Asian parties or the Asian and non-Asian or so what do they choose in terms of institution or seat or um, tribunal makeup or is there anything special? Uh, what I would like to share by using this moment is like most of the corporate lawyers, please, 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 whether it's a, a license agreement or whatever agreement it is, whenever you are drafting a dispute resolution clause, please work with us <laughs> because normally they don't, I can see that they don't really put a lot of thought in it. They just cut and paste. And then sometimes they want to be clever. Then they say like, sometimes if you, if you're the infringer, we started in China. If you're the infringer, we started Korea, which makes no sense to the dispute resolution lawyers, but sometimes it makes sense for someone from commercial people. Mm -hmm. So yes. Right. So so it's the 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 midnight clause problem, right? They're at the last second. That's the last thing they're right before mm -hmm. they open up the champagne. That that's the last <laughs> thing they're looking about. 
Um, so, so you now actually, so you've had, what, what has your experience been about in, in terms of where these disputes are and how, what kind of shapes they take in terms of arbitration, um, in terms of uh, what institutions are preferred or what, what, what are your thoughts on between the Chinese and, um, and Korean parties in disputes or, or potential disputes? Mm. Are, are, are they, of course, your clients um, are wise and they come to you uh, when they're negotiating their agreements uh, before midnight um, to make sure that they get the proper advice, right? So what, 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 what uh, do you advise them and what do you see? Mm. Thank you, Mr. Uh, uh, Professor Kim. Um, uh, as before, my... one, one, one point, I'm sorry, before I, before I I'm sorry. One thing I have to, we had some, a question actually, <laughs> two questions about Dan's movie that he was advertising. And the question was, of course, what's the title of the movie? And the title in English, they translated as My Sassy Girl. Um, so for those of you that, are, I, we already have two questions on that. <laughs> so My Sassy Girl, is the, that was the poster that Dan recommended. Of course, he does not recommend the sea crow. Uh, I'm sorry, back to you now. Yeah, thank you, Professor Kim. Um, because most of my clients are Korean companies or Chinese companies, so uh, I have to, I, I only can tell uh, what, is the, what are their preferences. Uh, for Korean companies, they prefer to select um, SIAC, KCAB, or uh, HKIAC. Uh, when it comes to the arbitration clause, because it's um, it's very easier to easier for the Korean companies to ex um, to uh, to experience uh, because they are located in Asian countries, and then um, a lot of Korean companies have kind of fears uh, to Chinese company and Chinese arbitration, so uh, they almost go for this arbitration. Uh, and the seat of arbitrary, of course, um, primary uh, selection is the uh, Korea uh, because they, it, is, it is, of course, uh, their primary country. But uh, uh, in reality, uh, because of the negotiation power of the Chinese company, uh, usually uh, when I see the arbitration close, uh, it's usually the seat of arbitrary is usually in China. That's, that's my experience. And from Chinese companies perspective, uh, of course, most Chinese companies uh, very care about the dispute resolution clause itself, uh, rather than, uh, not rather than, but um, relatively stronger than Korean companies. So uh, in, in practice, usually, uh, when Chinese company, uh, when it comes to the midnight decision, Korean companies just um, like forgive, uh, just 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 let the arbitration close goes as mm -hmm. like uh, Chinese company wants. Uh, so Chinese company usually select CTEC or other arbitration institution in local province of China, mm -hmm. um, and this would this gives rise to a lot of difficulties for Korean company um, in the later stage uh, when there really arise arbitration cases mm. because arbitration in China, uh, the practice of the arbitration in China mostly follow the practice in civil lawsuit in China. And it's very different from... Sure. Uh, you're you're muted actually. Oh, um, okay, sorry. Yeah. So I, I'm curious. Um, anybody, particularly, uh, but maybe Yuna has more experience. But what about um, bilingual arbitrations where they're requiring more than more than English, or what? What has or trilingual, or I don't know. What What about the language issue? Uh, for my experience, for the language. Um, parties prefer to select one language mm -hmm. instead of two languages, because mm -hmm. uh, if you select two languages, then there have to be the tribunals who can deal with those 
two or three languages. Mm -hmm. So uh, you have to narrow down the pool of the tribunal. Uh, so that's why parties in practice, uh, they select one language. And if you meet Chinese company, they will insist Chinese. <laughs> and <laughs> and um, if you do not- You have a very with... bright future, Yuna, <laughs> <laughs> as an arbitrator. I have to practice more. <laughs> Yeah, actually, so I remember that um, I would I had heard that some Chinese companies, um, because they did not uh, want to have like a typical British barrister or QC um, as one of the tribunal members, they wanted to narrow down the pool. So they actually deliberately required that uh, Chinese was one of the requirements. Um, but I don't know. I don't know how common that is. But I heard that there were some cases like that. But I guess not in your experience. In, in Singapore, yeah. we've done some arbitrations uh, where, where you know, basically, I think the language of the arbitration was both English and Chinese. And mm -hmm. you know, all the pleadings were pain to draft because you have to have both English and Chinese inside. Um, what would happen in the hearings, of course, is that parties would agree to one language. I think that's obviously easiest. Um, but I, I think in Singapore, a lot of our arbitrators are, are quite proficient in Chinese. So, you know, I, I think those trust issues uh, were, were, were you know, mitigated somewhat. Mm. Um, if you didn't want an English barrister, you could have someone in Singapore who could speak Chinese. And, mm -hmm. and generally speaking, they were okay. Mm -hmm. um, so, Nicholas, for, sorry, now I'm asking questions. But um, from your, your experience, if you have to prepare everything, every pleading, every submissions in two languages, uh, how, what kind of impact would have it on the costs? Would it be like double the cost or triple? Uh, I wouldn't say it's double the cost. Uh, we would basically have an associate who's very proficient in Chinese who would uh, basically do the translation or, or you know, failing which will get a translator to do it. Obviously, there is a question that I've not had to deal with, which is what happens if there is a slight difference in interpretation between the two versions. Uh, generally, we will provide that one one supersedes the other. Um, but in, in terms of cost, it's not that much. It, it can be streamlined to a certain degree. It's just that it, it does take a bit more time to translate, but it won't be double or triple. Uh, and of course, that it does significantly narrow the pool of potential arbitrators but to the benefit of Singaporeans, um, and of course, some in, in Hong Kong and elsewhere, um, and of course, Yuna as well. Um, so um, I guess that we have to go back to, of course, our wise man in, in, in San Francisco. So Dan, I mean, um, what do you think kind of in, in the future? I mean, do you think there are going to be more disputes, less disputes? Um, um, wh what do you think in, in related to the Korean wave and in the Korean cultural economy? Sure. I think, I think the easiest answer is to say, yes, there will be more disputes, right? Mm. Because typically if there's, I mean, the number of disputes is just a function of business, business activity, right? So if business activity were to increase by 20%, you expect the number of disputes to also increase by 20%. But I think that's just the straightforward answer. But um, I'd like to maybe, you know, highlight a couple of things that we can maybe take note of going forward. So one, you know, topic that I've always been interested in is, is the role of culture in, in arbitrations. Um, so here in the U.S., you know, I, I deal a lot with U.S. Asia disputes. Um, I, I think a lot of the, at least some of the disputes I think could have been avoided had there been a better understanding of cultural differences. I, I think in some cases that's true. Um, and, you know, if the Korean wave, if it's true that it's going to, in a way, export, you know, sort of like Korean culture overseas, you know, make people from different places understand a little bit more about um, how Koreans sort of like think and, and do business, you know, maybe this might actually have the opposite effect and, um, you know, result in fewer disputes. And that's something that perhaps would be interesting to, you know, just take a, take a look at. Um, but I think the other thing is that... Um, Perhaps, you know, sort of the, the question underestimates the amount of business activity Korean companies have overseas. Um, so if you look at, you know, various sectors, whether it's electronics, which everyone knows, uh, construction, which perhaps fewer people know, and even sort of like in the transport and logistics um, sort of sector, you know, Korean companies do business all over the world. So 
um, you know, there are already a ton of disputes. I think this is the one thing that shocked me the most because um, at least from my experience, I've seen as many Korean sort of like related disputes as Chinese related disputes in the US. And that, and that surprised me um, over the past decade. So uh, there are already a ton of disputes. So I guess on the other hand, perhaps it's good that there aren't any more. Mm. Now, of course, uh, a problem that uh, um, constantly comes up is that, um, and of course, maybe this is to the benefit of Korean uh, dispute lawyers or lawyers that do Korean related disputes, but that the when you have a Korean party, they're too willing to fight, uh, perhaps when they could have settled, or they could have gone to mediation, or they could have worked things out. Um, do you think that's going to have an impact in terms of uh, Korea, Korea, Korean cultural culture related disputes? Or is this is kind of the general similar thing is going to happen. Yeah, I think I think probably not, since both parties ought to understand each other's sort of like cultural background already, right? So I guess the only worst thing is 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 you know in the the only worst thing than having a Korean party in arbitration is actually two Korean parties in an arbitration <laughs> each other. And I've actually done this in New York, um, which was a little bit surreal because. Um, you know, there were a lot of Korean lawyers sort of like seated behind the counsel and, you know, it, it, to me, I mean, I was on the tribunal in that case. And to me, I was like, this, this should actually have been in, you know, taking place in Seoul. But there we were in New York, you know, arguing to, you know, big Korean companies up against each other. So, you know, yeah. So but yeah, definitely a lot of disputes. <laughs> and, and whether it's Korean wave related or not, Korean rave related disputes probably going to follow the same kind of um, trend, I guess. Yeah, I, 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 I think so. Yeah. I think so. Yeah. Mm. Two Korean parties on both sides, that's going to be tough. <laughs> I feel for you, Dan. I feel for you. Um, so, um, for the Nicholas, um, there's a sense that um, just IP disputes in general and IP related matters relative to other sectors, they don't really go to arbitration or they don't really, doesn't really kind of, I don't know if this is a proper term to blossom into a dispute. Um, so why is that? And is that going to be similar, do you think, related to Korean wave related disputes or anything different there or a different angle? Well, obviously, if you look at it from a traditional standpoint, you know, IP disputes and IP infringement, that tends to be a tortious action, or at least, you know, in Singapore, it's what we're familiar with. And, you know, obviously, there's no contract. So parties would need to agree to bring the dispute to arbitration. And obviously, you know, at the point that the dispute begins, no one is in the state to agree to anything, and no one trusts anybody. So that's, that's the basic issue. Um, but from a broader perspective, I mean, if we consider licensing issues and distribution agreements, which are more easily brought to arbitration, um, for a long time, there was a question as to whether or not an IP dispute can be arbitrated. You know, so you, you know, you know, IP is a creature of statute, and the statutes usually provide that a dispute has to be dealt with at a particular forum, usually a court or you know, an IP specialist court. And so for the longest time, there was a question as to whether or not uh, you know, an, an IP award from an arbitrator would be enforceable or not. Now, in Singapore, two years ago, we made changes to our International Arbitration Act to make that happen. So we changed the wording of our International Arbitration Act to state that an IP uh, dispute, and, and it's very broad ranging, you know, any kind of IP dispute, even in relation to the subsistence of IP, whether or not a pattern is, it should be validated, can be addressed by arbitrators and it wouldn't be against public policy. So we are taking that step and I, I understand that a lot of countries are doing that. So insofar, and we've also added that, you know, we would recognize a foreign award that deals with IP as well. So if someone overseas got an award, let's say in Korea, that says that, you know, a certain IP, uh, you know, a certain pattern should be invalidated or whatever, you know, that can be enforced in Singapore. It shouldn't be an issue. Um, Obviously, there's a question in Singapore if, as to whether or not if you get an award here, whether you can bring it back to a certain country and have that enforced. And I guess there may still be a bit of, you know, a bit of a question mark as to whether that's the case. I, I'm not sure what the situation is in Korea with regards to recognizing IP, um, you know, in arbitration. 
Um, but I, I think that's, that's the main stumbling block. So this only really took place two years ago. And uh, I, I think people are, are you know, getting around to, to the reality that IP can be arbitrated. And uh, you know, there is a global trend towards it. So hopefully we will see more uh, IP disputes going to arbitration. Certainly, you know, obviously licensing and distribution and, and they're all, you know, agreements will come up of the, the whole Korean wave. Uh, amongst other agreements, and so all of these things are right for arbitration. And uh, parties need to know that, or at least be reassured that they can bring something like that to arbitration and not end up with a piece of paper that that would serve wouldn't serve their purposes. Um, I guess Nis Nicholas just asked the question. We have the preeminent expert on this. So, what's the situation in Korea then, Sungmin, for enforcement of <laughs> IP awards? Uh, well, I wasn't expecting this question, but uh, based on my knowledge, as of today, we don't have a clear law or act that's specifying arbitration as uh, IP, validity of IP rights are arbitrable in Korea. But at the same time, based on some Kore Korean court cases, we can infer from those cases that in Korea, because especially because arbitration, it, it is not announcing to the world. It's actually a uh, uh, enforceable between the parties who enter into that that specific agreement, and so in that situation, in that to that extent, it is arbitrable, is is uh, the majority view. Mm, mm, mm. And since we are on the uh, enforcement topic, so maybe uh, for me, uh, maybe I can share some of my experience enforcing an arbitral war against Chinese parties, and mm. also um, please uh, what mm? yes mm. and. Go and, on. What, and if we if we fail to monetize arbitral war directly against the Chinese parties, what would be a, a different creative think, way of thinking to benefit your clients? So this is something that has been always uh, to us, especially when we were uh, uh, dealing with Chinese parties. But to sharing my experience, I, I had a HKIC award he did in Hong Kong a long, long time ago, and it was like uh, done by heard by stellar arbitrators like Professor Chun Yi Kim here. So it, there was no reason uh, this this would be challenged. And actually, we were trying to enforce it against the Chinese party. And for those, most of you, you know that in China, it's signatory to the New York Convention. And also there is this internal reporting system where the Supreme Court of uh, PRC, they would, they would uh, control even the uh, district court. And therefore, even in the district court level, if they want to refuse an enforcement of an arbitral award, they have to internally report it to the intermediate court and the PRC court and get approval and then come down. So it takes actually a long time. Also because the, of the internal reporting system. So it inevitably invites all of the views of the entire court, which is very interesting for most of the lawyers in other jurisdictions because normally for a court judge, for other court judges to uh, uh, have a say on the merits of the case that that, that, that person is dealing with, actually it's a, I thought it was a, a slightly unique system, but actually it actually had the enforcement delayed. So uh, the good news is at the end of the day, I got my enforcement judgment PRC from the PRC court, but the slightly bad side is that when I started the arbitration, notice of arbitration, I was pregnant. Around the time I got my uh, judgment, uh, my my daughter was singing, uh, which is like, well, we could have conversation and stuff. So it means it was very much delayed. But that was not the end of the sad story, actually. At that point, from that point, it, uh, unless the other side voluntarily complies to, to voluntary decides to comply with arbitral, well, we have to go through coercive measures. And coercive measure, again, you have to go to the rural area back and every step of the state stages of the coercive measure, you have to actually get approval or aid from the rural court, like uh, assessing the value of the factory and the land, everything. And it got massively delayed. So I have to say, uh, directly enforcing an award against Chinese party can be still bumpy, and there could be a lot of variables actually that can be an obstacle. In this situation involving an IP dispute with this creative industry, what can we do over the past uh, years? What we can, when a, a client is hesitating whether to go 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 to arbitration because of these uh, expected obstacles, we can actually. Uh, guide them to certain certain ways that that to uh, let them know that there are other other elements that can indirectly benefit the client uh, not not 
although it may be a bit bumpy to directly monetize arbitral awards. First of all, is that when you win an arbitration case and in, by a fellow arbitrator tribunal, they have announced like certain declar declaration and arbitral award. Although you may fail the, to enforce the monetized uh, monetary part, the declaratory part is going to be very powerful so that uh, the stock price always, always goes up. And I've been experiencing it many, many times. So it, it many times. So that's something definitely you can share with your clients. And because of the existence of this, normally the tribunal would announce the, the scope of the license, whether the license agreement has been terminated. So there is going to be these declarations made by the tribunal. And because of those facts, you can it, it, it would resonate to the market that there's going, you are now free to go enter into another license agreement with another party. So normally in these situations, you would license it to another Chinese party, normally who would be the competitor of the former licensee. And, and then in this uh, gaming, in the gaming industry, in the online platform industry, it's normally always, always about traffic, traffic, or how to, how to get more traffic in this industry. So by license, giving a, a third party, a competitor in the Chinese market, a license agreement, and allowing that Chinese party, the new licensee, to crack down the copyright, any copyright infringement activities of the former licensee, now that it becomes, it, it, then the, uh, the new licensee would have the powerful tool to get all the traffic from the former platform. And it's going to be a very a powerful uh, tool. And this can always happen even by the existence of an arbitral award has been declared that the license agreement has been terminated. So using all these tools and in the business, business setting and thinking out of the box kind of thing, you can actually guide your clients to a different benefit, although you may fail in monetizing directly the arbitral award. Hmm. So um, yeah, that uh, reporting requirement, of course, is, is very powerful in uh, China. And of course, that adds tremendous kind of robustness to the uh, recognition enforcement of awards. And of course, China is very proud of this reporting system. And it's very unique. Um, and of course, it, if you're a lower court judge in a very remote area of China, you're very hesitant to deny enforcement because you know it's going to get reported up the, up the ladder. Um, and of course, but despite that, of course, as Sumin just mentioned, there can the process can be bumpier than we expected. Um, all right, we have an interesting question from uh, Mr. Kevin Gao, and his question is, uh, what do you think um, of mediation in solving video game infringement cases? Uh, what are the pros and cons, uh, particularly given that the Singapore Convention has come into effect? And um, I think Nicholas has the uh, key a view on this i'll try i'll try so I, I guess you know with mediation the, the key obviously is trying to get parties to to come to a mediated agreement and you know assuming that that is possible which has its own problems in itself uh you know obviously if you think about it there's no real impediment to to you know to video game disputes and, and a mediated agreement coming out of that Obviously, you know, there are always commercial terms that can be negotiated between parties in a dispute of that nature. Um, so it's just a question of sitting down and dealing, going through the, the possible uh, solutions that will provide, uh, that will prevent the dispute from escalating further. So as, as a starting point, uh, you know, mediation should be an effective tool in, in dealing with these issues. Obviously, the Singapore Convention uh, is, is intended to give greater effect to mediation agreements, make them easier to enforce across national borders. So obviously, when you have a, a cross-border dispute, like you would have, you know, usually have a kind of a K-wave situation, um, you know, you could, you, you would have, if you have a signatory country that you're bringing your mediation agreement to, they would put in place a streamlined means of enforcing that agreement. So the idea being you wouldn't have to go through the entire court process all over again in order to enforce your agreement. Uh, the agreement would, uh, you know, the actual enforcement would be a lot easier. Um, obviously the Singapore Convention is very new and we have to have a look uh, at how each country ratifies it and how, how you know, these, these processes take place in practice before we can come to a view on how effective it is. Um, but, you know, on the face of it, certainly mediation is, is definitely a good tool.
tool for dealing with, with issues of this nature. And the Singapore Convention will probably help quite a lot, especially given the, the cross-border nature of it. Uh, okay, I'm, gonna, I'm catching up on some interesting questions. Um, of course, this will be on the fly. We have another interesting question from Eddie Kim. Uh, Eddie's question is that the Chinese government uh, is not issuing gaming licenses to most Korean game companies. And uh, so his question is, what do you think is the key underlying reason for this? And what do you think can be done? I'm wondering if Yuna can answer that since she's on the ground, but I'm not sure. Um, you want to take a stab or? I don't, I don't know what the issue is exactly, so. I don't know um, what the license that he's talking about is, but. Mm, I'm not very sure, but okay. uh, maybe Professor Kim, uh, uh, Eddie Kim uh, was, asked, uh, was mentioning uh, for a certain time of the period in China, uh, when Chinese government did not issue online gaming licenses, not the licenses, but uh, in detail it is ISBN number, uh, mm -hmm. which you have to uh, you have to mandatorily get before you launch uh, foreign game in China. So uh, maybe um, he is asking about this question and um, for the underlying meaning, and reason for this kind of situation, I think that it is not very appropriate for me to directly answer this question because it will touch some kind of Chinese system <laughs> in public. So, okay. uh, yeah, maybe you know I can. Be, yeah, I you can. You know, answer. might be squid gamed. <laughs> <laughs> um, um, based on my limited experience, actually, the, so. The Panho was ISBN was issued for, by the Chinese government to actually control the, the contents or the number of, of the IPs. And I understand that um, there are some rumors that actually they have been trying to control this Panho because the, the, some of the Korean IPs, especially some of the on the online business gaming business, they were too popular and too influential. And therefore, that was one of the reasons why they actually started to control these numbers. And especially after the thought missile issue, I think I've heard that not, not many of the Korean companies actually uh, got, got these panels because of those political background as well. How to resolve this? It's, it's a very, very sensitive and uh, difficult question, actually. And from uh, apart from explaining the background, I don't think I can actually helpfully uh, propose any, suggest any answer. But I, I think recently they, there have been certain game gaming companies who got panel as well. So I think there could it could be also bumpy, but it, it, it's not like totally banned from that. So mm -hmm. yeah, and, and it's also related to Chinese government policy. So um, this year, China and Korea have formed the profound historical and cultural ties. Like this year is the launch of the China South Korea cultural exchange year. And the year 2022 will mark the 30th anniversary of China South, South Korea diplomatic relations. Um, so uh, maybe like in the future, maybe hopefully uh, many foreign companies can get ISBN numbers uh, in China. Uh, okay, um, we have another question. Uh... This is from Mr. Shin Usak. Um, his question is, is there any expected progress on Chinese related arbitration uh, based on the recent revision of the Chinese Arbitration Act? Uh, of course, the Chinese Arbitration Act was recently revised. And do you think that's gonna change anything significantly in terms of, um, I guess, potential Korea and Chinese related arbitrations? I don't know. Um, as far as I know, um, I think that the Arbitration Act of China ha has not been changed recently, but IP, uh, many of IP regulations. Uh, and proposed, revision, proposed revision, proposed uh, revision. Proposed revision. Uh, yeah, I, 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 ha I have not chance to, I didn't have chance to get to get the 
proposed revision of the mm. Arbitration Act. Mm. So um, maybe I'm not the appropriate position to answer the question. Mm. Um, but um, uh, I think for arbitration cases, uh, for Arbitration Act of China, because Chinese government uh, wants to uh, promote arbitration and mediations uh, like ADR uh, instead of court proceedings in many fields, especially for IoT, IT, and TMT, uh, such a new uh, development, a new technology uh, section. So I think that um, uh, maybe in the future, like uh, the most, uh, as like in Singapore, maybe the, the IP disputes that can be course to arbitration in China can be uh, interpreted as broadly, broader than previous days. Mm -hmm. um, okay. Um, so just as a general matter, um, there's a, if an IP dispute arises, of course, and a lot of these Korean wave related disputes potentially could be IP uh, related disputes. So, I guess the the option uh, is you could go to court or you could go to arbitration. Um, what are the pros and cons, um, Nicholas? Well, obviously, I guess the key thing about Korean wave matters is that there will be a cross border element. So most likely, you would have a situation where by a rights holder in Korea or primary rights holder in Korea would be in a dispute with somebody else in another country, uh, be it Singapore or anywhere else, because you know, it, even could be a, it could be a dispute between someone in China and someone in Korea that's heard before the SIAC in Singapore. And the, the key benefit of arbitration, obviously, is the enforceability of the award uh, in, in the country in question. As, as Yuna uh, mentioned earlier, it's a lot easier to enforce an arbitral award uh, compared to a, a court judgment in relation to IP. So, so with that in mind, that, that is the key uh, benefit uh, with the Korean wave. There's also the question of confidentiality so that parties, you know, arbitration obviously is completely confidential and there may be parties here who may not want, you know, an ugly licensing dispute out in the public, you know, while they themselves are negotiating further licensing deals with other parties. So there's something else to consider. And in terms of the uh, confidentiality point, <laughs> excuse me, so Nicholas, have you been involved in any disputes where uh, confidentiality was a very important consideration, but it was not um, followed, complied with properly? Have you had that type of experience? I have to say I have not, very <laughs> fortunately. <laughs> okay, that's, well, yeah, that's, that's, that's good, that's good, um, of course, but it can. And we do know, of course, that sometimes things get leaked um, whether intentionally or inadvertently, but I guess in um, Nicholas's nice world, people behave properly and you don't have these mistakes. Um, okay, I guess um, the other thing is, um, of course, uh, Dan has, a, I'm wondering what Dan's thoughts are on, you know, what, and you kind of hinted at it before, but um, when you have the Korean party involved, um, and of course, this would be, of course, our case in a Korean wave or culture related party, um, how are they different from other parties? Um, and in, in particularly in terms of arbitration, you mentioned some things, but anything else or anything stands out? Yeah, I think I think the one thing that stands out to me most is really the openness of Korean companies to various forms of dispute resolution processes. Mm. Um, I think I think typically if you if you look at a party from say China, <laughs> uh, I think as you and I has, has kind of mentioned, they 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 try to keep the dispute within Chinese borders. Like they try to, you know, opt for CTEC arbitration or or something within China Chinese courts. Um, and in many ways, you know, U.S. companies are, are, are parochial in that same way, right? Because if you're up against Apple, for example, it's, it's always Santa Clara County, right? Federal court. Um, they, they, they try not to go to arbitration somewhere else. 
But I think one thing that's always struck me about Korean companies there is it's really an openness to embrace uh, sort of like arbitrating, you know, elsewhere. So I gave you the example of, of you know, two Korean companies, um, you know, arbitrating a dispute in New York. And, and that struck me as, as something that was really unusual because they, they could have done this in Seoul, but instead they've elected to come in New York. Uh, Michelle, who organized this talk actually, and, and I actually met Michelle for the first time in Hawaii in an arbitration. Uh, it was an arbitration where, against, uh, where a Korean company was against a, a U.S. company, and the seat was actually Maui, not even Honolulu, it was Maui. <laughs> and, and what eventually happened was that the parties agreed to arbitrate in Honolulu. So uh, we were there in a subterranean basement, uh, I think for three days, uh, just right next to Waikiki Beach. We were the only ones in suit, so you could tell we were not. We were there to like, do something else, not on a holiday. Uh, but you know, it, it's it's really this openness to embrace, or maybe you know, Korean companies just like to go to nice places for a good time. So uh, that that's the other alternative. But but again, I you know, you see Korean companies in Singapore all the time. Um, they're they're very open to you know, sort of like embracing arbitration elsewhere. They don't insist on Seoul or like Korean courts all the time. So that's something that's always struck me. Well, of course, the, the reason they're in, they were in New York is because they wanted Dan Tan on that tribunal, of course. Um, that's, of course, that's the clear reason. You know, but uh, promoting uh, more uh, Asian disputes and hearings in Maui, of course, is a very interesting thought. Um, I know that this is, um, I know there's uh, some serious mediation occurs in Hawaii, but I think that's something definitely should be uh, further promoted for everybody. Um, I guess uh, then we have the kind of the golden question um, that is all on our minds is, I mean, what does the future look like? I mean, I remember at least, at least five years ago, um, it may be even more, I was in my first Korean wave related seminar uh, related to arbitration. And I was like, yeah, you know, how long is this going to last? Um, and here we are um, still and still going strong. Um, Korean culture is taking the world by storm. It just keeps on going on. Um, so there's a tremendous reservoir of Korean talent. Uh, of course, one of our panelists here is a, is a contributor, content provider to Korean culture. Um, I won't name exactly who it is. I'm sure people will know. But I mean, what's in store for the future? Do, do we see more disputes? What kind of disputes? Where are they going to be? Any, any, any thoughts, Sumin? So it's it, like you've suggested, it's extremely difficult to envisage what's going to happen in 10 years' time. But then one thing that I think I would like to end my uh, must by sharing one of the quotes that Chief Justice Sundresh Menon has, has stated in a, uh, Singapore shaping the future of dispute resolution and improving access to justice. Um, he, he said that an ideal system of justice is one that delivers justice that is, that is customized to each type of case, keeping in mind the subject matter, the parties and the desired outcomes. So I think in, in the in going forward, it would be very important for our uh, arbitration practitioners to have an open mind, be very flexible, and always think of a different means to resolve uh, any disputes that's coming. Mm, 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 mm. Any thoughts, Nicholas? I guess moving forward, you know, IP is an area that changes consistently, and you know what we used to do in the past, we you know they're very different from what. The, the nature of our practice today, and that's going to change moving forward. And you I, keep have to keep on, you know, mastering new games and the process as well. Yeah, it's really <laughs> tough. You know, I mean, you know, they're getting more and they're more and more difficult to play. And you know, as you get older, it doesn't help. You know, your reflexes start to slow down. But you know, I, I mean, there are also other things like, uh, you know, we've got we've got cryptocurrencies as I mentioned earlier. You've got NFTs, non fungible tokens, and you already see in the West uh, a lot of pop culture are using non-fungible tokens in order to, to you know, make money in trade. Um, you know, whether these, you know, how these relate to IP, of course, is an open question and that is a subject for a lot of debate. But, you know, it could be well be that, uh, you know, moving forward, you know, the Koreans might take 
adopt NFTs as a means of you know, monetizing their intellectual property in these pop culture icons. And we might start to see that kind of thing as well. So, you know, who knows what the future holds, but, uh, you know, that we have to be live to these changes. Hmm. Hmm. Um, many thoughts, Yuna? Um, well, uh, I think that in the future, the Korean way will gain more power. Uh, along with the, those uh, technical developments in the world wide. So I think that there will be many tentative arbitration cases. But uh, if I talk about the IP related uh, arbitration, I think that because of the requirement for the written arbitration agreement to start the, to commence the arbitration, uh, some of the IP disputes uh, still cannot come to the arbitration proceeding because, uh, for example, if you are an IP owner and you sue an infringer and the infringer says that he got licensed from a competent right owner. And then even though you and the infringer agreed to arbitrate this case, but there is no arbitration agreement between you and the so-called competent right owner. So no specific laws and regulation exist as to such situation these days. So um, you might want to, maybe you might have to suspend the arbitration procedure until the IP right is clearly decided uh, in court proceedings. Uh, or um, like, like, like now I, what I can think of the option is just like that. So I think that to uh, the IP related disputes uh, to promote arbitration proceedings. I think that um, uh, legislative uh, works has to be done for adding some related party without uh, arbitration agreement or something like that. Okay, um, I, I, I note we're basically we're running out of time, but um, Yun Sok-chan uh, from uh, Kim In chang has, a, has added a comment in terms of Korean law. And his view is that uh, in terms of the validity of IP rights, it's arbitrable only to the extent um, you're seeking damages or you're trying to defend against damages um, in the context of an infringement of IP rights. That's what his, uh, he wanted to add that comment. So uh, I... I uh, I agree with that that comment because, as mentioned, we are not announcing the validity to the world in REM, but rather between those two parties. So that's mm. the, the same context. Okay, yeah. great. Um, all right, I think um, we're right on time. I want to thank our esteemed panelists for providing a very insightful and interesting panel. I hope um, you people, our, our audience, learned um, and gained some knowledge on the state of affairs in terms of Korean wave related disputes and the potential in the future. And I'll turn it over to uh, Michelle. Thank you so much, Professor Kim. Uh, thank you so much to all our panelists. That was a really interesting discussion. And I, and I agree with Professor Kim that we, we did learn a lot about the Korean wave and what we might have in store for us in terms of possible disputes and how best to resolve them. Um, thank you so much to our attendees for joining us today. Um, I hope that you enjoy the rest of your day, afternoon, morning, wherever you are. And I do hope you're able to tune into some of the other events at the Seoul ADR Festival this year. Um, take care and have a great evening.